Oh, right. We should be recording. Now we're going to try something a little different, like I said, uh, on Teams. Uh, today's lesson is relatively short, and if you followed the lesson, you probably don't need to hear uh, me lecture on it. Uh, but if not, I wanted to give this an option. So I'm going to post this up before class tomorrow and give you guys the option here so that we can spend the majority uh, of the class actually uh, answering questions and working through an example. So today is a uh, difference of uh, the means. As a quick reminder, we've got homework and lab seven due next Monday and the GR2 next Wednesday. So we'll definitely be talking about that in class a little bit for anyone who has that. Uh, so what we are doing is we are gonna do uh, talk about confidence intervals and hypothesis tests for a difference of means. We already talked about how to uh, do a hypothesis test and a confidence interval for a mean, meaning the average of some numerical variable. Now we're just going to talk about how we wanna do the difference of two means, right? So whereas before I would do a hypothesis test uh, to say, I think the, uh, is the average uh, USAFA cadet height greater than, uh, you know, 70 inches, uh, I would say my null hypothesis is that the mu USAFA height is 70 inches. And my alternative is that mu USAFA height is greater than 70 inches. And I would either build a confidence interval around that or a hypothesis test. Now we're going to ask a similar but slightly different question of saying, is the uh, average height of USAFA cadets greater than the average height of uh, West Point uh, cadets, right? We are comparing two means to see what the difference uh, of them are. So let's move into looking at this. So when we were doing an interval, uh, when we first introduced the idea of a confidence interval for the mean, we said, hey, all we gotta do is figure out our T star and then figure out what our X bar is, which is our uh, sample uh, mean, and then we just go a margin of error above and below, where the margin of error is T star times the standard error. The standard error here is the uh, sample standard deviation divided by the square, square root of our uh, sample size. When we want to do a confidence interval for the difference of the mean, it is very similar, uh, just with a few slight changes. Instead of one sample, we're going to take two samples, right? Because if I'm comparing USAFA cadets height to uh, the uh, West Point's height, I need to have two samples, one from each. I'm going to calculate two point estimates. I'm going to calculate the sample uh, mean of uh, each uh, of my samples. I'm going to check both samples for independence within and between. So what this means is normally we would talk about saying, hey, the average, uh, I, when I look at my sample of how I'm uh, taking my sample from uh, USAFA, I wanna make sure that it is a simple random self, uh, sample, that there's no, um, that the observations aren't dependent. I didn't do something where I said, hey, uh, Jeff, I'd like you to be in my sample and pick five of your friends to be in the sample as well, right? Because then it is no longer dependent because Jeff is, uh, deciding who they are. So the other uh, members of the sample are dependent on Jeff, right? I want to do the same thing for West Point, but I also want to make sure there's no independence between the two, that somehow there's uh, the choice of the USAFA sample does not affect the choice of the West Point sample. Uh, and then I also have to check my outliers, meaning my normality, right? When we said, hey, look at each of the sample sizes and say, is the sample size less than 30 or equal to or greater than 30? And depending on that, I'm going to say, am I looking for clear outliers or particularly extreme outliers? And if it's greater than 30, is it looking normal? So I'm going to do that for each of my samples now. Same process as before. I just have to do it for each of my samples. Then I'm going to calculate the standard error for the difference, right? So before, when I was calculating my standard error, that was how I calculated my standard error, was just looking at the sample standard deviation of my sample divided by the uh, square root of the sample size. Now I have two samples and I have two standard deviations and or two sample standard deviations and two sample sizes. So now I am going to use this equation. That is the standard error of the difference, right? That's denoted here. I'm finding the 
standard error between the uh, the difference of the the two means. Once I have that uh, standard error, uh, the next thing I have to do is do the degrees of freedom. Now, before the degrees of freedom were just I took my sample size and went one less than that. Here, I have two sample sizes. They don't have to be the same. I could have a my sample of cadets from USAFA could be. Uh, I could have 20 cadets, and then from West Point, I could have 15, right? So the sample sizes can be different. So the way I'm going to do my degrees of freedom is I just pick whichever sample size is smaller, and then that minus one is going to be what I uh, call my degrees of freedom. There is, if you look in, I don't think it alludes to it in the book, but if you read anywhere else, there is a much more complicated equation for getting an exact degrees of freedom. But in general, uh, this just choosing the smaller sample size and then subtracting off one is the easier uh, way to do it. And the other way is not really uh, worth all of the effort for lack of a better explanation. Then we calculate the T star. This is exactly how we did T star before, right? It is one minus, and then I said one minus C over T here. This is just a kind of a complicated way of saying Hey, if I want a 80% confidence interval, then that is my C equals that. So I'm going to say, so one minus C would equal one minus 0 0.8, which would equal 0 0.2. So going back over to here, then I would have that divided by 2. 0.2 divided by 2 would be 0.1. So one minus 0.1 would give me QT of uh, 0 0.9 if I wanted an 80% confidence interval, and then I have to give it my degrees of freedom, uh, whatever they may be. Once I have that T star, then it's just putting it all together, right? I center my confidence interval around my estimate, right? Before, my estimate was just the uh, X bar, the sample mean. But now my the thing I'm estimating is the difference. So I'm going to center it around my estimated difference, my X bar one minus my X bar two. So that's where I'm centering it because that's the thing I'm estimating it. And then plus or minus T star times my new standard error. That's it. That's the con that's the confidence interval for a difference of sample means. If that makes sense, hypothesis testing is not going to be a whole lot more exciting, right? Because for our hypothesis test, we are, just like when we did the difference of proportions, our, our hypothesis test for a difference of means is going to be that there is no difference, that uh, mu1 minus mu2 is zero, that the average height of academy cadets minus the average height of uh, West Point cadets is going to be zero. Now, just so you guys don't get confused, sometimes you might see this as h naught is mu1 equals mu2, right? That and that are the same, right? All I've done is moved uh, mu2 over to the right. So saying there's no difference is the same as saying they are the same. So be prepared to see them written uh, both ways. Then we have the alternative hypothesis. Now, this is where some of you guys get confused a little bit. Where I want to talk a little bit more about this on the one last slide. But the alternative hypothesis we can uh, talk about, do we have a uh, lower tailed, upper tailed, or both, right? Do I, am I, is my alternative hypothesis that that's simply not true, that, there, it, that the difference is not zero? Uh, or am I saying that my alternative is that it is lower than zero or that it's greater than zero? And that depends, that, that changes how we calculate the p-value. We'll look at it, uh, that in a second. Then we decide what our significance level is. If no one's given, just assume 0.05 is the standard. And then like the common interval, we take two samples of size N1 and two, we take two point estimates. We check both samples for independence within and between uh, and outliers, uh, look at the normality, calculate the standard error the same way we did for the confidence interval. We calculate the T-score. So this is, this is new, right? Because for the confidence interval, we are saying, I have no idea what the real difference is. So I'm gonna estimate it and I'm gonna build a margin of error on either side and say, I am, some percent confident that the real difference is somewhere in here. Now we are making an assumption saying, hey, I am assuming that the real difference is zero. So I now need a T-score to uh, that's going to say basically a, a measure of how far off my estimate was from my expected, right? Because right here, that is my estimated difference. 
subtracting off my assumed difference, which is always going to be zero. Minus zero obviously doesn't change anything. I just put it in there to remind us that that is what our assumed difference is. And then divided by the standard error. And that's going to give me a T score, which is really a uh, number of standard errors off of how, how many standard errors away my uh, estimate for the difference was from what I expected the uh, difference to be under the null hypothesis. Then I calculate the degrees of freedom, same as we did for the confidence interval. We look at the two sample sizes, whatever the smaller one is, we subtract one from that. That's our degrees of freedom. And then I'm going to calculate my p-value. Now, this is the part where I think sometimes there is some confusion uh, because some of you get the uh, do this correctly, either by trial and error or by luck. But I wanted to make take a second to understand that when we calculate the p-value for something like this, the p how we calculate the p-value depends on the alternative hypothesis, right? So in this case, if I am looking at the uh, if the alternative hypothesis is that the difference is less than zero, then I want the lower tail, right? If it is that it is greater than zero, then I want the upper tail. And if it is that it is simply not equal, then I want both, right? Because in, in essence, this first one, I'm finding this tail here. For this one, I'm finding this tail here. And for this one, I am interested in both tails and that's why I have that times two uh, and but what's important to understand is that it is completely based on the alternative hypothesis it does not matter uh, what your test statistic is it's not like if it is big enough then you go for the upper tail and if it's small enough you go for the lower tail how you which tail you want is dependent completely on the alternative hypothesis. And we'll look a little bit about that on the last slide, uh, give you some examples. But that's uh, how we decide how to calculate the uh, p-value for this different of uh, difference of means. And then once we have that p-value, same story as before. We compare as all of our other hypothesis tests. We compare the p-value to alpha. If the p-value is less than alpha, then we reject our null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, then we do not reject the uh, null hypothesis. That's all there is to it. Okay, and then interpret it to the scenario, right? If this was a, if we we're looking at heights here, if I rejected the null hypothesis, then that would mean that I am rejecting that there is no difference, meaning there is statistically significant evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so the last slide I wanted to look on was a little bit of review of saying, all right, so we have this null hypothesis of the difference, right? And so really what's happening here uh, is that we're saying I am assuming that the true difference is there centered at zero and all my that means all my other uh, estimates that are going to get are, that I'm, I could get are distributed according to this t distribution around them right and then uh, wow I do not know what happened to my uh, code there uh, let's see this uh, real fast here that is a new one i do not know uh what is going on there um we will leave it right there just assume that uh, that should that picture for some reason is not loading uh but the point is is that that picture should look very much like this picture but reversed right so i'm going to draw a really bad picture here and say this is looking like that right because when the alternative hypothesis is that it is less than zero, we are looking for that lower tail, right? Which we said is calculated where T is our test statistic that way. And when we want the upper tail, uh, we are looking, saying I, my test statistic is up here and I'm looking for a upper tail. But when we have this middle, uh, uh, this middle uh, situation here, where the alternative is simply that it is not equal, that means, I don't care if it is higher or lower. I just want to know, uh, I'm looking at the alternative that it is not zero, meaning uh, I am interested in the possibility of how far away it is in either direction, right? So here, when I calculate my p-value, the way I calculate it depends on the test statistic I get, right? Because if I'm saying it could be anything except zero, then I am acknowledging that I might get a test statistic that is too low. 
or I might get a test statistic that's too high, right? So if it is too low, if I get a test statistic that is too low, then the way I find my p-value is I take the lower tail and then I multiply it by two because this is going to be symmetric. On the other hand, if I get a test statistic that is too high, then I'm going to take the upper tail and then multiply it uh, by two, right? Because otherwise, if I were to just always do this times two, I run the risk of getting a situation where I get this as my test statistic. And if I use this, I'm going to find this entire uh, area here and then multiply it by two. If you ever get a p-value that is greater than one, then you know you've probably done something like this, right? Because p-values are probabilities. So if you ever get a p-value that is greater than run, one, that is not a valid uh, p-value and you've done something wrong. Probably something uh, like this or something uh, else. That is in, but it, in either way, uh, it merits further investigation. Okay, that is our quick review of how the p-value re uh, relates to the alternative hypothesis. Uh, the What we're going to do for class tomorrow or today, if you're looking at this on Monday morning, is uh, I have two scenarios. So this is the first scenario. I'm going to have you guys uh, read this, and then I have uh, posted with this a uh, RMD file. It's uh, linked on uh, Teams. Well, I'll put a link here as well. Download uh, the RMD Lesson 23 Difference of Means. That is going to be an RMD that completely runs this first uh, scenario, right? So I want you to run through the entire program. And then tomorrow, I want you if, uh, to ask any questions you have about uh, that RMD, including the concepts, the calculations, and the code in there. I want you to not only understand it, be able to use it uh, yourself. Because once you've got your questions answered, or if you don't have any questions, what I'd like you to do is to take that code and edit it to answer this uh, scenario too. This is a similar but slightly different scenario that if you understand the lesson that we're doing today and you understand how to use that code, it should not be a whole lot of trouble to uh, make slight changes to that code to uh, answer this second scenario. And so that's what I would like to do tomorrow. As soon as uh, you have uh, done that tomorrow, whether you finish it tonight and want to give it to me at the beginning of the class, or uh, you do it in the middle of the class, you are free to go tomorrow. I'm just looking for a uh, for this scenario two to tell me uh, what your p-value is and what your uh, conclusion is uh, for that scenario. Uh, so send that to me either in class or uh, before then, and we will move on from that. Otherwise, I will spend the rest of class answering questions about this lesson, about the code, or anything general that we have uh, on uh, homework uh, or lab work or upcoming uh, quiz and GR that you may have. So uh, I need uh, everyone is going to show up and we're going to work through this. If you don't watch the video, then I will, the link will be available and you can watch it during class while I am answering any other questions people have. Uh, otherwise, uh, I hope this is uh, helpful and interesting. If it is not, give me feedback of either this was a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, and I will see you guys on either Tuesday morning or I am seeing you uh, right now. I hope your uh, weekend went as well as mine did and that you guys got a chance to enjoy the snow. I will talk to you guys tomorrow or continue to talk to you guys today. This is a very meta conversation. All right. Bye.